Hi, welcome to our YouTube-friendly version of NTD News. What you'll see here is only the content that YouTube allows. For our complete uncensored broadcast, head on over to ntd.com. See you there. We begin with an update on the deadly bus crash in New York yesterday. Authorities are investigating after a bus carrying a high school band rolled over on Interstate 84 in Orange County. The National Transportation Safety Board and New York State Police are investigating the cause. Preliminary reports suggest the possibility of a blown front tire. The bus was carrying 40 students and four adults from Farmingdale High School in Nassau County to a band camp in Pennsylvania. The bus tumbled down an embankment, killing two adults on board. As of this morning, 18 people remain hospitalized, including five students in critical condition. State police are asking anyone who may have witnessed the crash or the bus before the crash to contact them. A Democratic senator has made history. Senator Bob Menendez has been indicted for the second time in nearly 10 years. He and his wife are accused of accepting bribes in exchange for favors. NTD's Arlene Richards has more details. Committee 21 to 1. New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez is accused of leveraging his position to benefit a foreign country. That's according to an indictment announced on Friday. Today I'm announcing that my office has obtained a three-count indictment charging Senator Robert Menendez, his wife Nadine Menendez, and three New Jersey businessmen. The indictment says Menendez and his wife developed a corrupt relationship with three New Jersey businessmen and accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars of bribe to protect and enrich those businessmen as well as the government of Egypt. Agents searched the senator's home and safety deposit boxes. They discovered approximately $500,000 of cash stuffed into envelopes and closets. That's not all. Agents also discovered a lot of gold. He said the three kilograms of gold they found are worth $150,000. U.S. Attorney Damian Williams then describes some of the alleged conduct. Among other actions, Senator Menendez allegedly provided sensitive, non-public U.S. government information to Egyptian officials and otherwise took steps to secretly aid the government of Egypt. We also allege that Senator Menendez improperly pressured a senior official at the U.S. Department of Agriculture to protect a lucrative monopoly that the government of Egypt had awarded to HANA. The indictment states the senator took other steps to secretly help Egypt, including pushing other senators to lift a hold on $300 million in aid to the country. His wife Nadine allegedly received a Mercedes in exchange for the senator interfering with a New Jersey prosecution. And in 2019, she got help with mortgage payments to avoid foreclosure. I'm appalled. Uh, anybody who pays attention, I don't care your politics, Democrat or Republican, you should be appalled. Uh, a member of Congress who appears to have broken the law uh, is someone who I believe should resign. This is the second corruption charge against Menendez in nearly a decade. The previous case ended with a deadlocked jury. In a statement Friday, the senator said, the excesses of these prosecutors is apparent. They have misrepresented the normal work of a congressional office. On top of that, not content with making false claims against me, they have attacked my wife for the long-standing friendship she's had before she and I even met. Menendez has been in office since 2006. He is up for re-election next year as Democrats hold a narrow majority. Senate rules will force him to step down as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee due to the indictment. Menendez and others will appear in federal court next Wednesday. The prosecutor says the investigation is ongoing and encourages the public to come forward with any information. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Arlene Richards, NTD News. The auto worker strike is expanding. Workers are now set to walk out of 38 plants. NTD's Jack Bradley brings us the story. We're not going to wait around forever for a fair contract at the big three. Sean Fain, the president of United Auto Workers Union, on Friday announcing an expansion of their strike. So today, at noon Eastern Time, all of the parts distribution facilities at General Motors and Stellantis are being called to stand up and strike. No more tears. Workers are expected to walk out of 38 General Motors and Stellantis plants in 20 states. 
Fain says Ford was spared additional strikes because the company has met some of the union's demands during negotiations over the past week. I want the levels to be balanced. I want everyone to make a good um, living and a fair li living. The UAW is seeking pay raises of more than 30 percent over four years, a 32-hour work week for 40 hours of pay, and more. The companies are offering around 20 percent on pay, health care benefits, and more. Automotive News reports that the union's goal with the strike is to keep the companies wounded for months. That's according to leaked internal messages. General Motors reportedly responded saying it's now clear that the UAW leadership has always intended to cause months-long disruption, regardless of the harm it causes to its members and their communities. The union on Friday invited President Biden to visit striking workers on picket lines. The White House didn't immediately commit to doing so. Over in New Mexico, two men have been arrested in connection with the deadly shooting of an 11-year-old. The boy was killed outside an Albuquerque baseball stadium earlier this month in what police suspect was a case of mistaken identity. The incident prompted an immediate response from Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. She ordered a 30-day ban on carrying firearms in Albuquerque in what she called a cooling-off period. But that order soon faced bipartisan backlash and court challenges. On September 13th, a federal judge suspended the ban for violating Supreme Court rulings on the Second Amendment. Police say that one of the suspects in the shooting was already facing charges of drug dealing, and the other was arrested with over 100,000 fentanyl tablets in his vehicle. A new White House office on gun control. President Biden says it'll save lives as Republicans warn of further actions. NTD's Iris Tao has more from the White House. And President Biden today announced the creation of the first federal office of gun violence prevention. He says it'll save lives as Congress is stalled on passing stricter gun laws. We hear a simple message, the same message all over the country. And I've been to every mass shooting. Do something. Do something. Well, my administration has been working relentlessly to do something. The new office will be overseen by Vice President Kamala Harris. Its goal is to find new actions on gun control that the White House can take without Congress, including by identifying new executive actions and working with local governments to pass laws on the state level. And Biden again calling for to ban assault weapons high capacity magazines and saying this to voters. Safety of our kids from gun violence is on the ballot. And Biden now of the new office will work just like FEMA. Coordinate more support for survivors, families, and communities affected by gun violence, including mental health care, financial assistance, the same way FEMA responds to natural disasters. But Republicans are sounding the alarm on this new office. They pointed out that an activist tapped as deputy director of this new office works for an organization that's seeking to declare a national public health emergency over gun violence. Over 20 Republican senators on Thursday introduced new legislation that they say will prevent the Biden administration from declaring a public health emergency to impose gun control. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. The mayor of a major city switching political parties. Dallas Mayor Eric Johnson today announced he's switching from Democratic to Republican. Johnson published an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal titled, America's Cities Need Republicans and I'm Becoming One. The mayor said while Dallas has thrived elsewhere, Democratic policies have exacerbated crime and homelessness. The future of America's great urban centers depends on the willingness of the nation's mayors to champion law and order and practice fiscal conservatism. The Dallas mayoral office is nonpartisan, but Johnson previously served as a Democrat in the Texas legislature. The mayor noted that he's not changing his policy priorities. Those are bringing down crime, lowering taxes, and creating a friendlier business climate. Johnson is now the only Republican mayor among America's 10 most populous cities. And we now know when the Republican presidential candidates will be squaring off for their third primary debate. CNN says it will take place on November 8th in Miami, citing a source familiar with the event. NBC News and Salem Media are reportedly in talks to host the debate. 
to qualify. Candidates must poll at over 4 percent and have at least 70,000 unique donors with at least 200 unique donors per state in over 20 states. Meanwhile, the candidates are preparing for the second debate, which takes place next Wednesday in California. As of Thursday, six candidates have said they qualified for that debate. Former President Trump will not attend. Be sure to tune in to NTD's special coverage after the debate. Moments after a military pilot ejected from his F-35 fighter jet, a 911 emergency dispatcher got the call of a lifetime. We have a military jet crash. I'm the pilot. We need to get uh, rescue rolling. I'm not sure where the airplane is. It would have crash landed somewhere. I ejected. Help on the way. Give me just a moment, sir. Where am I going from? Yeah, what are we getting? All right. Okay. How far did he fall? Was it 2,000 feet? The pilot had ejected from his plane while over South Carolina, the military says, because of some sort of malfunction. The $100 million fighter jet flew by itself for some time before crashing and was found 24 hours later. It didn't hit any populated areas. The pilot made a parachute landing in the backyard of a South Carolina resident who made the phone call. The exact cause of the plane's malfunction is still unknown. Welcome back. Succession. Billionaire Rupert Murdoch has stepped down as chairman of Fox Corps and News Corps. Eventually, his four children could potentially battle for control, determining the future direction of the news giants. Entities Jack Bradley has more. Media giants News Corp and Fox Corp are often considered to be right-leaning organizations. This perception could change. Billionaire media mogul Rupert Murdoch has stepped down as chairman of Fox Corp and News Corp. These conglomerates own Fox News, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Post, Barron's, and HarperCollins Publishers, to name just a few. They have tremendous influence on media, business, and politics, especially in the United States. Murdoch is currently 92 years old. After his passing, his voting powers will transfer to his four children, Prudence, Elizabeth, James, and Lachlan. Lachlan has been named chairman of both Fox Corp and News Corp, but his three siblings could potentially outvote him in the future, changing the direction Lachlan wants to move the companies. Lachlan's political views are similar to his father's. Think tanks that advance uh, the agenda, which might be described as conservative, uh, center-right. Uh, so we know that he's put his money uh, behind uh, think tanks of that kind. So. I think, to be honest, also, he's uh, well known in the U.S. for being or having been a Trump supporter. Analyst Alice Enders believes that there will be a seamless transition between Lachlan Murdoch and his father. She also doesn't see potential for much conflict between the siblings. This is not a family that uh, is, you know, torn by ideological you know, fights. You know, they are all uh, very respectful of their father and his legacy. The political views of Prudence and Elizabeth Murdoch are not known, but James has openly told media outlets his concerns about climate change and the January 6th Capitol breach. He resigned from News Corp's board of directors in 2020, citing disagreements over editorial content. Meanwhile, Murdoch's youngest children, Grace and Chloe Murdoch, have no voting rights. Jack Bradley, NTD News. Robocops in New York City. The NYPD today rolling out a new security robot to patrol around the Times Square subway station. The 420-pound device will be working from 6 in the morning to midnight, while accompanied by an actual cop. Here's Mayor Eric Adams announcing the launch at a press conference. We are committed to exploring innovative tools to continue to make this city the safest big city in America. And this... uh, A robot, K5, it has the potential to serve as an important tool in our toolbox. The robot will be actively recording videos throughout its shift for the NYPD to review. Officials say the machine doesn't have facial recognition and it won't be recording audio. It'll be on duty for two months as a pilot program. And as we reported yesterday, more drugs were found at the New York City daycare center where a one-year-old died and several other children were hospitalized last week. All the children were exposed to opioids. Investigators discovered a hidden compartment under the floor in what was the children's play area after a new search warrant was issued. 
The NYPD said they discovered fentanyl among the 22 pounds of different drugs found in the compartment. Police also discovered drug paraphernalia in the same area. A previous search uncovered over two pounds of fentanyl stored on top of play mats used by children. The owner of the daycare and her husband's cousin, who rents a room at the property, were both arrested. They were charged in state court with murder of depraved indifference. Both denied knowledge of and involvement in any illegal drug operation. Authorities are looking for a third suspect who is believed to be the owner's husband. The suspect was last seen on the day the child died, carrying two full shopping bags through a back alley outside the property. Both defendants opted not to testify before a grand jury. Their next court date is scheduled for October 5th. Federal authorities believe that the fentanyl at the daycare center, along with 90 percent of the fentanyl in New York, originates in international drug cartels. Joining us to share his thoughts on the drug problem in New York, along with possible solutions, we have the founder of the Guardian Angels and former candidate for New York City mayor. Curtis Liwa, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on the show. Uh, pleasure to be with you. Curtis, it's been one week since the tragic death of the one-year-old at this daycare in the Bronx that's due to suspected fentanyl poisoning. How is the community reacting so far? The community is saying that that was a drug house for over a year before it was converted to a daycare center as a cover and that it actually was run by illegal aliens from the Dominican Republic. So the community seems to know far more about it being a drug mill than the police or the mayor. Now, on that note, the NYPD has discovered drugs there under this trapdoor. They are suggesting it could actually be this drug operation. How likely is that? Oh, it's very likely. It's the perfect cover. You claim that you're a daycare center taking care of children. In the meantime, you're cutting up drugs, which is what they were doing, cutting up the fentanyl as it was coming in and then mixing it with heroin, mixing it with cocaine, and then having men come by, transport it out, and dealing it in the streets. A very lucrative business, very lucrative. And now, zooming in on the drugs, fentanyl has claimed tens of thousands of Americans' lives, and that number just keeps rising every year. It seems most of it is traced back to coming across the Mexican border, but with precursors or the source materials coming from China. What can be done to stop this illicit flow of drugs into the states? Well, there's also a lot of fentanyl that comes in the bottoms of ships in the cargo containers, because you can only check a very scant few of those when they come into the port, or commerce would come to a complete halt. Look, we blame everybody for our drug problems. America has an insatiable appetite to get high. I'm in the streets every day. And the dope fiends, the people who shoot heroin, are actually going to their drug dealers and say, I hear there's this new great drug, fentanyl, in which you get a super high. I want fentanyl. So this idea that Oh, the drug user is being fooled with fentanyl. I'm sure that happens sometimes. But most of the time, the drug user wants the fentanyl. So America is at fault. We have the demand, and there will always be those who will produce the product for the demand. And given this tragic incident with this one-year-old and it seems this increase in drug use in the city, what needs to be done? How can we solve this? Well, we certainly can't decriminalize drugs because that's what the progressives and the socialists want to do. We have to start making arrests. These are killer drugs. This is not marijuana. This is fentanyl. And if taken in the wrong dosage, it's a killer drug. So what's the difference between killing somebody with a gun or killing somebody by giving them fentanyl? To me, it's the same. You got to lock them up. You got to put them away for a long time, and that will act as a deterrent to the kind of widespread sales of fentanyl we see in the streets of New York City now. And Curtis, now circling back to the daycare for working parents who do need to send their kids and toddlers to a daycare, what needs to be done to ensure their peace of mind going forward? You cannot send your children to a fly-by-night daycare center that just appears out of nowhere in the basement of a tenement in which people are living upstairs. That's not the way you run daycare. That's called illegal daycare, and there are plenty of those daycare centers because they don't charge that much money. 
the city has to supervise it and padlock the illegal daycare centers. And parents have to understand the most precious resource they have are their children and grandchildren. And stop trusting strangers. You better get to know who runs your daycare operation before you send your children or grandchildren there. Indeed. Well, Curtis Lewa, thank you so much for your time. Anytime. Human trafficking, violence, and more is on the rise after California legalized what is often considered a harmless drug. A local sheriff is speaking out about drug cartels that make use of the state's lax marijuana laws. NTD's Sean Marshall brings us the details. Law enforcement agencies in Northern California say illegal cannabis farms are one of the main threats to public safety. Local sheriff Matt Kendall recently spoke about the issue with Epic Times California Insider. The sheriff says while Mendocino County is home to 90,000 residents, as many as four to 5,000 illegal cannabis sites have been recorded this year alone. When you drive around, you can hear gunshots almost all night long in the fall. And what wow. it is is a warning to people saying, I am armed in my marijuana grow. Don't come out here. He said families used to come to the rural county with a 50-year plan, wanting to build homes and connections. But that changed when marijuana was made medically legal in California in 1996. And all of a sudden, a lot of people showed up who did not have a 50-year plan to raise their families, be good people, take care of their neighbors. A lot of people showed up with a two-year plan to make as much money as they possibly could, not care about the environment, not care about their neighbors, and uh, it came with a lot of violence. The sheriff says his county can only assign two deputies to marijuana plantations, so they can't take care of all illegal plantations, only the ones that stand out. If a grow site has uh, human trafficking or, or violence, that gets you on the radar. He says a few years ago, they encountered a 16-year-old Hispanic girl at a plantation. That's when he changed his approach. At that moment, it dawned on me, a lot of the people that we thought were suspects we need to slow down and have a conversation with them because they probably are victims. Says the cartels bring victims of human trafficking to California to use them for slave labor. Another outcome possibly stemming in part from the decriminalization of marijuana is addiction to hard drugs. The sheriff says the cartels brought hard drugs with them and got locals hooked. So once local property owners are addicted, the cartels offer them free drugs in exchange for property use. Now it's, we're going to give you some methamphetamine, but you're going to sell some of it for us. Wow. They've addicted a lot of people, and we've got a lot of addictions going on, and they're basically making slaves out of them. He says Mendocino County is now number one in the state per capita for narcotics overdoses as a direct result from the legal drug trade that has entered. Boarded up windows and for lease signs are taking over Los Angeles' Beverly Hills shopping district. NTD's Christina Corona visits the area to see the current situation. Beverly Hills is known around the world as one of the most fashionable places to shop. We're here at the heart of it all on Rodeo Drive, but some stores are looking quite different lately. Approximately 11 retail establishments in Beverly Hills have closed their doors. Boarded up windows and for lease signs have replaced the once lively storefronts. Among the notable closures are the former Barney's location, Brooks Brothers, All Saints, and the upscale women's fashion boutique Escada, both of which filed for bankruptcy in recent years. The closed shops, which also include convenience retailers like Rite Aid and Chipotle, and even a popular workout class. Soul Cycle have shut their doors on Wilshire Boulevard. The reasons behind the closures vary, with some brands experiencing reduced demand for in-person shopping experiences after the pandemic. Lately, businesses in California are grappling with a significant surge in crime, leaving many stores vulnerable to robbers. Despite some of the businesses here being closed or are for sale, Rodeo Drive is still alive and thriving. Christina Corona, NTD News, Beverly Hills. The Federal Trade Commission is under fire, accused of illegally concealing documents about Elon Musk and Twitter. NTD's Daniel Monahan has more on the lawsuit by America First Legal. The House Committee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government issued a staff report in March concluding the FTC harassed Twitter after Elon Musk bought it. 
The report found that the FTC inappropriately stretched its regulatory power to harass Twitter and misused a consent decree, which deals with safeguarding user information, to justify its campaign of harassment for political reasons. Following the release of the report, America First Legal launched an investigation into the FTC and filed a federal ethics and inspector general complaints. The goal was to determine whether the agency engaged in partisan retaliation against Elon Musk and Twitter for exposing what it calls the Biden administration's collusive censorship. America First Legal claims that the FTC ignored the law and refused to search for or hand over the requested documents, calling that a violation of the Freedom of Information Act. America First Legal Vice President and General Counsel Gene Hamilton discussed the lawsuit, saying, our woke, weaponized federal government will stop at nothing to harass and attempt to intimidate its perceived opponents. The American people have had enough. What they have done in the dark will be brought to the light. The FTC said in an emailed statement that it has no comment on AFL's lawsuit. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. NASA is preparing for the return of a space capsule that they hope will shed light on the origins of our planet. It's been collecting samples from an asteroid and expects it to arrive this September. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. The OSIRIS-REx spacecraft launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida in 2016 and reached the asteroid Bennu two years later. The surface basically acted like we hit a pool of water. There was no resistance whatsoever to the downward motion of the spacecraft, and that robotic arm plunged uh, 50 centimeters deep, about the length of my arm, into the subsurface of the asteroid. The mission hopes to unearth the secrets of our planet. The spacecraft spent another two years collecting rubble from the surface. We spent the entirety of 2019 mapping that asteroid, selecting a location we dubbed Nightingale. And in October of 2020, we sent the spacecraft down to collect a sample from that area. In May of 2021, the spacecraft departed asteroid Bennu. A capsule containing rocks and dust from Bennu is expected to land in the Utah desert in September. The asteroid is an estimated 1,600 feet wide and 4.5 billion years old. It's believed to hold the preserved building blocks of the solar system and could shed light on how life arose on Earth. Asteroid Bennu is a time capsule from the very earliest stages of solar system formation. The minerals and the chemicals that make up this asteroid literally formed before the Earth even existed as a planet. So we're really going back to the dawn of the solar system. But to get the samples into laboratories, NASA first has to safely recover the capsule. Scientists are already practicing how to retrieve it. So one of the, the big challenges of bringing the sample back to Earth is just targeting that capsule to the right point in the Earth's atmosphere so it'll land in the desired landing zone in Utah. And that's the challenge that our navigation team and spacecraft operations team is working on right now. The SUV-sized spacecraft is expected to deliver its capsule to Utah's desert floor on September 24th. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Welcome back, and now for your sports news, here's NTD's Dave Martin with a gender-neutral team name change. That's right, Tiff. Spain's national women's soccer team will now simply be known as Spain's national soccer team, which is actually the same name as the men's team. The change was made by the Spanish Football Federation. It comes after the now former Federation president kissed one of the players on the lips during the team's World Cup winning celebration last month. Interim President Pedro Rocco said, quote, We want this to represent a conceptual shift in recognition that soccer is soccer, regardless of who plays it. No word yet on how people will differentiate between the two teams. And in college football, could a promotion and relegation system be in store for those teams outside of the now Big Four conferences? As reported by Front Office Sports, the idea, which would be similar to the European soccer model, was floated by Boise State Associate Athletic Director Michael Walsh. The proposal would include a 24-team, three-tier alliance made up of schools outside the power conferences, like in the Mountain West, the AAC, Conference USA, and whatever's left of the Pac-12. Now, the system would work by demoting the last place team from the top tier while replacing them with the first place team of the tier next down, and so on and so forth. 
The perceived benefit would be a bigger media contract while targeting NBC, Amazon Prime, and Apple as potential TV partners. Now, it's unclear how much traction this proposal has, but it will be for football only. And in LPGA news, golfer Amy Olson, who played while pregnant this season, gave birth last Friday to a girl named Carly Gray Olson, according to her Instagram account. Congratulations to mother and father. And for your sports viewing schedule tonight, 14 baseball games are on, including a pivotal Rangers-Mariners matchup as both teams are tied for the wild card lead. And that's it for your sports news today. Tiff, back to you. A rare baby anteater joins the Los Angeles Zoo. Now that the pup is a month old, it finally joins its parents to greet visitors. Entity's Stephanie Sakal reports more on the adorable newborn's journey. The Los Angeles Zoo is celebrating the successful birth of a southern Tamandua pup, a first-time event for the Sioux. The pup, born to Lou and Mika, both first-time parents, arrived on August 28th. The Sioux will determine the pup's gender later through blood work. Mallory Peebles, a senior animal keeper, emphasized the significance of this birth, highlighting it as a unique opportunity for Sioux visitors to witness the development of a newborn Tamandua. The Sioux is thrilled with this new addition, reflecting the exceptional care provided by their dedicated team. Mika's pregnancy lasted 164 days. She was closely monitored by the animal care team who employed non-sedative ultrasound exams. Mika and the pup are adapting well to the habitat, with Mika displaying nurturing behaviors such as cuddling and carrying the pup on her back during exhibit tours. The birth is the result of a recommendation from the Southern Tamandua Species Survival Plan, an effort to maintain genetic diversity in North American zoos. Visitors can now observe the newborn pup and its parents at the nursery near the Winnick Family Children's Zoo. Stephanie Sikal, NTD News, Los Angeles. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. That's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.